So uh, good morning for those who don't know me. I'm Roberto, I'm a PUI5, and today I'll be giving my Ground Rounds presentation. Uh, this title, More Than Just Instrument Instrumentation, The Importance of Bone Metabolism on Surgical Outcomes. Um, here's a brief um, outline of the talk for, uh, for today. Uh, we're gonna talk about why bone health assessment is important. We're gonna review the bone macro and micro architecture and also touch on the basis of the biology and physiology of uh, bone metabolism. Uh, then we'll review some of the pathologic diseases that affect bone density and how can we diagnose them. And at the end, we'll talk about some treatment modalities, especially pharmacological treatment. So why a bone health assessment is important? Let's we'll start with some analogies. Here's a educational pamphlet that is given back at my home island in Puerto Rico uh, to instruct people on not to build houses on certain terrains in the rural, rural areas. But still there are some people that uh, disregard uh, the warnings and still build houses on uh, not some stable terrains. And you can see here on the right that perfectly built houses with some minor precipitating factors can be end up destroyed. Here's another example. Uh, this is um, some houses at the mountain area in Utah. You can see on the left, a perfectly built house uh, that en ends up being destroyed uh, because um, they ignore the fact that the importance of uh, building on a, a strong uh, foundation. The same concepts in some ways can be uh, applied to spine surgery. Here on the left, we have a standing scoliosis x-rays showing some uh, level of kyphal scoliosis. The patient underwent surgical uh, intervention and the six weeks post-op x-rays showed proper placement instrumentation and correction of the sagittal balance. But this patient had underlying uh, decreased bone mineral density and it was not treated aggressively. Um, this resulted in what we can see here on that one year post-op x-rays, where we can see proximal junctional kyphosis. And we can take it a step further if this is further ignore, this is what happens at least in a two year follow-up. The patient has a worsening of the proximal junctional kyphosis. There's a fracture through the disc space and obviously this is a nightmare to repair. So this is why bone health is important. If we can identify certain risk factors, we can uh, try to avoid uh, some of these disasters. Uh, who knows what grain of America is? Uh, at least I didn't know until I saw this slide. It's basically that in less than two decades, uh, for the first time in US history, uh, older adults are gonna number children. That is estimated, I think, it, by 2034, there are going to be 77 million people which are going to be older than 65. So with this knowledge about increasing the aging in U.S. population, we know that there's going to be a linear increase in patients with decreased bone mineral density. Uh, in individuals found to have poor bone quality, and an assessment alone provides little benefits if it's not followed by aggressive treatment and optimizing bone strength. Uh, I think we as surgeons have to take ownership as this directly affects our outcome. We have to have in mind that the medical doctors that usually treat patients with osteoporosis have a different mindset and they're usually looking for other outcomes like vertebral body fractures, hip fractures, and they do not understand what are the goals with surgical intervention. So we really have to take ownership of, of trying to help with this, this treatment. Uh, let's review some basics of the bone macro architecture. There are uh, at least two, uh, 213 bones. And there is important to know this, that they're metabolically active connective tissue that not only support uh, provide structural support, but also facilitates movements, protects vital structures, and serve our reservoirs for mineral and growth factors. They regulate uh, mineral acid-base balance, and also it's a site for hematopoiesis. 
Uh, bones, there are different types based on shape. There's short, flat, and tubular bones. But in respect to the vertebral bodies, they are considered short bones because they're roughly the same length in all directions. They're mainly composed of uh, loose trabecular bone and they ossify using endochondral ossification versus flat bones we mainly use intramembranous ossification. And we'll get into details of that uh, process a little bit later on the presentation. Uh, immature bone is woven. Uh, and some examples are embryonic skeleton, fractured calluses, bone neoplasm. It's usually weaker and they do not have the ability to remodel following stress patterns. Mature bone is lamellar, is stress-oriented, is stronger, but has slower turnover. So lamellar bone, which is mature, can withstand the stresses of surgery or spinal instrumentation. A lamellar bone is, can be either cortical compact or cancellous trabecular. They are composed of the same uh, cells, but they have different mechanical properties due to difference in uh, distribution, in their distribution and density. Cortical bone has densely packed osseans and they compose the majority of the skeletal system. Cancellous bones, on the other hand, have 90% porosity. Uh, they have large surface area and they have close proximity to the bone marrow, which is metabolically active. Uh, here's an illustration showing the different types of mature bone. On the top right, we have cortical bone, which is composed of densely packed osseans. And on the middle left, we have the consolidus bone, which is mainly composed of a densely packed trabecula. Um, the vertebral body uh, withstands compressive load, loads in the axis of the low, long, uh, of the spine, sorry. Uh, thanks to the densely packed trabecula. In osteoporotic patients, it is estimated that only 15% of the compressive loads are um, withstanded by cortical bone near the amplates. Within the vertebral uh, body itself, if you look at optical density, which is a surrogate of uh, bone mineral density, uh, the vertebral body has regional differences. For example, the bottom half of the vertebral body is denser in respect to the trabecula than the superior half. And this is believed to be that because the inferior half is in continuation with the trabecula from the pedicles. The end plates are composed obviously of cortical bone, but they do have some small holes uh, that basically let metabolites, metabolites get into the vascular intervertebral disc. The presence of these holes on the uh, end plates um, render, render them uh, to be um, uh, softer in some, in some terms or weaker than the trabecular bone. And this is why in fractures, the end plates are usually affected and they are referred as the weak link of the lumbar spine. Again, there's also some regional differences when comparing uh, the uh, end plates in respect to their, uh, if either their cranial or the caudal uh, part. The cranial end plates are usually weaker than the uh, caudal end plate. And this is because they're thinner and because the uh, caudal end plates are usually more reinforced by the trabecula that we just talked about a little bit earlier. Um, although I'm not going to go into too much details of instrumentation in this talk, uh, there are some uh, details that are important, especially if we want to understand how you know screws and different instrumentations are developed in respect to uh, the known microarchitecture of the bone. There are different types of screws, uh, but the main ones that we use are either cortical or cancellous um, screws. Cortical screws usually have a smaller thread diameter and they have and the threads are usually closer together with a lower pitch. On the other hand, we have consolidus screws, which have uh, a larger thread diameter 
and a uh, larger pitch. Traditional pedicle screws are considered to be trabecular uh, or Kinsella's screws and cortical based trajectory screws, which use cortical screws are usually, um, you know, have smaller pitch to try to engage the closely packed osseans on the cortical bone. In patients that have decreased bone mineral density, there have been several techniques that have been developed to try to overcome uh, the decrease in trabecular bone. Here on the top radiograph, we have a classic um, pedicled screw. And on the bottom, we have a cortical base uh, trajectory screw that basically uh, uses a cortical screw to try to maximize its contact with cortical bone. The idea behind this is to try to have a biomechanical biomechanical forces that are comparable to the, the ones used in the pedicle screws or even uh, higher uh, pull-out strength. Uh, there are several studies that have looked at this and there are uh, some evidence that suggests that cortical-based trajectory screws have higher pull-out strength than Kinsella's uh, traditional screws. And this is explained by all we just talked about, just understanding the macro architecture of bone, translating to how you know, we can use uh, different types of screws to maximize the outcomes. Um, yeah, Roberto, it's uh, Dr. Wang. Sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but I just wanted to just point something out. So very important to not confuse cortical screws, which is a technique and a marketing phenomenon mm -hmm. with cortical thread screws, which is a universal phenomenon. Right. So, you know, just be clear with the people who don't understand that there's a difference when you say cortical screws. That's something that Medtronic tried to push as a different trajectory. And they right. use this lingo or language, even though they're not truly cortical screws, right. versus cortical fixation, which can be in the brain, in the skull, I should say, or in, uh, in any part of the body and has nothing to do with surgical technique. Correct. Th thanks for clarifying. Yeah, Dr. Wayne is right. So, so cortical based trajectory is some, it, it's basically a, a different trajectory that's used um, when compared to traditional pedicle screws, but it, it also, um, also trying to bring here the difference between cortical screws itself and Kinsala screws. Uh, thanks, Dr. Wang. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about the microarchitecture of bone. We have different types of cells. First, we have osteoblasts that are located along the surface. They're about, they represent about 46% of the uh, bone cells. They have a bone forming function and they secrete osteo osteoid towards the bone matrix. They produce collagen one and they have the presence of alkaline phosphatase, which is responsible for bone mineralization. Here on the right, we have a uh, electromicrograph showing uh, the osteoblast, or as you create the osteoid uh, that produces eventually uh, bone. Next, we have osteocytes, which is the most abundant uh, bone cell. They're located within the lacuna, surrounded by a mineralized bone matrix, and they are derived from osteoblasts. So basically, osteoblasts become osteocytes when they become incorporated into the bone matrix. They have the presence of cytoplasmic, uh, cytoplasmic processes, which facilitate intracellular transport of, more of uh, small signaling molecules. They act as mechanical uh, sensors that detect mechanical pressures and loads, and they're responsible for the bone remodeling by regulating osteoblasts and osteoclasts. This uh, mechanical um, stimuli uh, is usually um, translated into biomechanical signals and it's called piezoelectric pio effect. And we'll talk about the uh, details of mechanosensory uh, regulation a little bit later. Uh, next, we have the osteoclasts, which are differentiated multinucleated cells. They're responsible for bone re resorption and they have the presence of proton pump, which help as acidify the resorption area and enable the dissolution of hydro hydroxyapatite crystals. You also have the presence of protease, 
that are responsible to create uh, the organic uh, matrix. Here on the right, we have another electron micrograph showing the multinucleated osteoclast with the presence of the vacuolar proton pumps in the ruffle border uh, doing uh, resorption of the bone. Uh, last, we have the extracellular bone matrix, which is mainly composed of either inorganic salts and a combination of organic matrix. Uh, type one collagen is the predominant uh, protein in the organic matrix. And the phosphate ions and calcium ions form the hydro, hydroxyapatite crystal. Sorry. Ma, ma, the matrix proteins, which is mainly type 1 collagen, form a scaffold for the hydroxyapatite deposition, which gives the typical stiffness and resistance of uh, bone tissue. Uh, now let's talk very briefly about osteogenesis. There's two types of uh, bone-forming uh, osteogenesis. One of them is intramembranous ossification, which uh, mainly uses the differentiation of mesenchymal cells directly into osteoblasts. And then we have endochondrial ossification, which uh, forms bone using a cartilage intermediate. To some extent, both modes of osteogenesis are responsible uh, for the fusion mass that we, uh, that we see after uh, spinal uh, instrumentation. So understanding why, for example, Dr. Wang or Dr. Vanny are so hard on us if we don't do proper uh, TP decortication goes back to understanding how osteogenesis occurs. When we do uh, the cortication of the TPs, we basically create a microenvironment where we have a hematoma uh, with blood products on top of or uh, either autograph or allograph that provides inflammatory cells or mesenchymal cells. So either intermembranous and endochondrial ossification process can occur effectively. And here's a uh, picture from a case we did yesterday, trying to apply the same concepts of how osteogenesis work. So basically here's a jam sheet needle and we're trying to, to uh, uh, obtain some bone, um, some bone matrix uh, from the bone itself to try to deposit in between the TPs with the allograft to try to facilitate the environment so osteogenesis can occur more effectively. Uh, now let's talk about bo bone modeling and remodeling. So basically this is the replacement of primary bone that has been formed through uh, either intramembranous or endochondral ossification by a more precise order lamellar. This is performed by what is called the basic multicellular unit, which is an osteoclast uh, plus an osteoblast. Uh, although this seems to be a uh, very complex uh, diagram, uh, we need to understand the basics of osteoclastogenesis to understand how different pharmacological treatment um, treat uh, decreased bone mineral density. Uh, osteoclasts are derived from a hematopoietic stem cell that in the presence of mar uh, macrophage colony stimulating factor differentiate into osteoclastic precursor. In the presence of receptor activating nuclear cap kappa ligand and its interaction with it, its receptor, osteoclasts become active. But there's a presence of another molecule called osteoproteurin, which is secreted by the stroma cells and osteoblasts that inhibit this interaction between the rank ligand and its receptor. And this leads to osteoclast apoptosis. So the rank ligand OPG axis provides a mechanism to uh, control the action and activity of osteoclast. And if you look at the different systemic molecules that have significant effect on bone resorption, they use to, they in some extent influence this rank ligand and OPG axis. And some examples are vitamin D, uh, estrogen, glucocorticoids, and um, PTH. 
Oh, now that we understand the basics of oxygenesis and bone remodeling, we can introduce another dimension of biomechanics. Here is a picture or an illustration of Dr. Julius Wolf, who was a surgeon, and he was one of the pioneers to introduce the concept of mechanotransduction. Mechanotransduction basically talks about the adaptive changes of bone in response to loading forces. Basically translates uh, mechanical forces into biomechanical signals. It talks about how bone remodeling and growth may be enhanced to greater loading of the graph under compressive forces. And there's some people that believe that interior application of an inner body graph leads to favorable, favorable compressive loading that will lead to greater fusion. And here is an illustration just talking about uh, that biolog biology behind mechanotransduction. So oxycytes are gonna detect the mechanical load. There's some fluid flow changes between the can canaliculi. And this is um, basically transformed into biomechanical signals that influence the activity of osteoclasts in osteoblasts. Now let's look at what are some of the age-related uh, bone, bone, bone changes in remodeling. We all know as we age, there is a direct decrease in bone mineral density, but men lose at, at around 30% less bone than women. Females, there's an extensive loss after menopause and the bone becomes more fragile with fewer trabecular and thinner cortices. Here's a table showing some of the cellular and molecular changes that happen after loss of estrogen. And some of them incre uh, include increasing the lifespan of osteoblasts and osteocytes would increase in the lifespan of osteoclasts. There are some molecular changes that include the increases in certain cytokines that lead to decrease in OPG molecules leading to increased activity on um, osteoclasts. Uh, there are some systemic factors that we know that come into play in bone metabolism. For example, PTH that is secreted by the parathyroid gland increases absorption of calcium and production of vitamin D. Calcitonin that is, is secreted by the thyroid gland lowers the serum calcium by inhibiting osteoclasts. And vitamin D is in, in its active form, increases calcium absorption in the GI and kidneys. And interesting, glucocorticoids have an inhibitory role in osteoblasts and increase the osteoclast activity by inhibiting OPG production. So let's talk a little bit about osteoporosis. We all know it's the most common metabolic bone disease, it affects around 10% of adults over 50. It's an imbalance between osteoclast and osteoblast activity and results around 700,000 uh, osteoporotic spine fractures per year. The prevalence of osteoporosis or osteopenia patients undergoing lumbar fusion, it's estimated to be around 15 and 43% respectively. So it's quite a significant uh, percentage in patients that are, are undergoing lumbar fusion surgery. Uh, it's not surprising. There's a lot of literature talking about the effects of osteoporosis on instrumentation outcomes. And some of them include, there, you know, reduces the effectiveness of pedicle fixation strength, increases the incidence of case of sidens, iatrogenic fractures, and the incidence of proximal junction of kyphosis. How, we do how do we diagnose uh, osteoporosis? Uh, we usually obtain a DEXA scan with a T-score of minus 2.5 lower. And there are some important limitations to using a DEXA scan. For example, this is not used for patients under the age of 65. Uh, it can add significant uh, cost to patient care and it's not recommended with patients that have previous screw fixation. How can we use a CT scan to measure bone mineral density? So using the Hounsell units, uh, it's been proven to be a surrogate for bone mineral density. Uh, there are several studies demonstrated that Hounsell unit correlate with DEXA values, both in osteoporotic and non-osteoporotic patients. 
There are some advantages, advantages of using CT scan. For example, it's quick and easy. It's a widely available technique and has excellent inter-observer variability. Interesting, hostile unit may provide more accurate measurements of bone mineral density in special, in special populations. For example, in patients with ankylosing spondylitis, severe degenerative disease, and in scoliosis. And this is what it, this is due because in certain skeletal inflammatory conditions, there are there are, are formation of a normal bone, and overall reduction in the bone quality per se, which can result in fat falsely elevated readings on the DEXA scans. Uh, here's a table comparing uh, uh, DEXA scans to CT. It's important to know, as we know, that. CT has high radiation doses, but if we routinely obtain CT scans for preoperative uh, planning, we can uh, we can obviate this, and also we can probably uh, obviate the need for a DEXA scan that usually adds around 200 to 250 in the cost of the patient care. Also, the DEXA scan measures most of the vertebral body components all in one. So it includes the cortex, the trabecular bone, the pedicles, and the posterior elements. While on CT, we can be very specific and measure either the pedicle, the cancellous bone. So we can measure different parts of the vertebral body uh, to see to you know to see which areas have decreased bone mineral density. And again, we see that the DEXA scan has some contraindications like previous instrumentation, spinal degeneration, and uh, scoliosis. Uh, here's an example of how you can uh, measure the Hunstall units on CT. Uh, you can measure them on, on axial slices, and you can use several axial slices and come up with an average uh, of uh, Hunstall units. Again, there's a lot of literature looking at this. Uh, this is a study by Picard and company, which look at at least uh, 20 hundred patients and they correlated uh, CT Hounsville units with the DEXA scans. And they uh, came up uh, with a, a value of uh, close to 160 Hounsville units, has 90% sensitivity of uh, ruling out um, uh, osteoporosis when compared to osteopenia, and a value of 110 has a 90% specificity specificity um, of diagnosing osteoporosis on CT scan. Uh, here's a meta-analysis uh, published uh, this year on the Spine Journal, which look at the diagnostic accuracy of Hounsfield units <coughs> in patients that were undergoing spine surgery. Um, they uh, came up with a threshold cutoff of 150 Hounsfield uh, units uh, for pool sensitivity, sensitivity of uh, close to 91%. So therefore, they suggest that a threshold of 150 is a clinical effective screening tool for uh, osteoporosis. Now, there's a lot of literature, literature talking about trying to correlate Hounsfield units to different instrumentation failures. For example, this study from their neurosurgical focus uh, from last year tried to associate lower Hounsfield units uh, to uh, the incidence of proximal junctional kyphosis. And they came up with a uh, Hounsfield unit value close to 104 at the upper instrumented uh, vertebra uh, to be uh, to have high sensitivity and correlation uh, to the development of proximal junctional kyphosis. And the same uh, close, you know, closer values to 110 at the upper instrumented vertebra plus one and uh, two levels above. Uh, the same was seen uh, with uh, association between health units and the presence of cage subsidence. Uh, they look at close to 100 patients, and they came up with a threshold uh, for segmental health units close to 135 to distinguish between the presence of mild and severe cage uh, subsidence uh, with a sensitivity of 60% and uh, specificity of 92%. Also interesting, after a univariate and multivariate analysis, 
for risk factor for developing uh, severe case subsidence, uh, they saw that segmental Hounsou units uh, was significantly associated, sorry, with the development of uh, cage subsidence. Um, also, another study that look at Hounsou units, and uh, in this, they look at if there was any correlation with pedicle screw loosening. And interesting, uh, they suggest that measuring the uh, Hounsou units in the vertebra body plus the measurements in the pedicle uh, it's better to try and to predict if there's going to be pedicle screw loosening in certain patient population. And they suggest two numbers. And on the pedicle, it's a Hounsou unit is less than uh, 340. And uh, with a combination of the uh, Hounsou units in the vertebral body, are less than 130. So now that we know how to diagnose uh, decreased bone mineral density, how can we treat these patients? So there are different surgical techniques. I'm not gonna go into detail because the talk is basically trying to stray away, stray away from just thinking about instrumentation to try to fix his patients, but you can do LAX fixation techniques, extend the fixation points, use cement augmentation, and accept a more modest correction in this patient population. And there are different pharmacological uh, treatments available for this uh, patients. There's mainly two types of uh, medical uh, treatment for this, uh, for osteoporosis, and they're divided into anti-resorptive and anabolic. In the anti-resorptive uh, category, we have biphosphonates and a monoclonal antibody called denosumab. In the anabolic um, category, we have a PTH or teriparatide and romosumab. Now uh, here on the right, we have an illustration uh, made by Roberto Suazo for one of our um, uh, papers that basically um, illustrates uh, which cell types are the target for different uh, treatment modalities. And obviously for uh, anti-resorptive uh, medication like bifosinase and denosumab, the osteoclast is the target. And for romosumab and PTH, osteoblast is the cell of interest. Biphosphonates uh, incorporate into the active uh, bone formation, binding to the hydroxyapatite crystals uh, that lead to decreased osteoclad activity and apoptosis. They can be subdivided into first generation and second and third generation, depending on the presence of a nitrogen, where the presence of nitrogen increases the potency of the drugs by 10 to 100 fold. Here's some examples of uh, biphosphonates, and uh, some of the skeletal side effects include osteonecrosis of the jaw and a typical femur fractures, and both of these are directly uh, correlated with the, um, the time of treatment. Patients that are longer treated by biphosphonates have higher chances of developing, for example, the skeletal side effects, and um, very interesting. Uh, PTH, for example, uh, they directly activate osteoblasts via cell surface receptors that induce uh, several growth factors, which include IGF-1, the results in increased cancer uh, quantities, especially of cancellous bone. Teriparatide was the first anabolic agent approved by the FDA for the treatment of decreased bone mineral density. It's important to know that the anabolic effects of teriparatide are quickly lost. And after that, uh, after discontinuation of uh, PTH, patients should be prescribed an anti-restorative agent if they still have low bone mineral density. For uh, teriparatide, there's a black box warning that we have to discontinue this medication because there is increased risk of sarcoma at two years. Uh, so, we put together a, a meta-analysis meta with the help of Vaya and Anthony with Dr. Wang and Dr. Levy that looked at the perioperative uh, treatment of osteoporosis in patients that were undergoing spinal fusion. We found around 11 studies to look at um, long-term outcomes of the treatment. And the main um, you know, pharmacological treatment that were included 
uh, and this analysis was by phosphonates and teriparatite. In respect to the effects of uh, treatment of patients with osteoporosis and fusion rates, biphosphonates had some interesting findings. When we compare biphosphonates to a control group at six months after a fusion uh, procedure, uh, biphosphonates had at least three times higher fusion rates when controlled when compared to the control group. But when we look at 12 months after surgery, that biphosphonate group had no different outcomes in respect to fusion rates when, control, when compared to the control group. And three studies that compare the use of teriparatide to biphosphonate, uh, there was an overwhelming evidence that showed that at 12 months, patients that were treated with teriparatide when compared to the bifosinate group, high, had higher uh, fusion rates. Um, in respect to screw loosening, there was two studies that looked at bifosinates, and there was no difference when compared uh, to a control group at uh, 12 months. And the same happened when comparing teriparatide to bifosinate. There was uh, no significant the difference in screw loosening at uh, 12 months. In respect to postoperative vertebral compression fractures, there were two studies that looked at uh, biphosphonates uh, compared to a placebo group, and patients that underwent biphosphonate treatment had uh, lower rates of vertebral compression fracture uh, when compared to a placebo group at uh, 12 months. Uh, in respect to bone mineral density, there were two studies that look at uh, comparing teriparatide to bifosinate. And although there was a trend of having higher bone mineral density in the teriparatide group, uh, this was uh, not significant, at least at 12 uh, months after surgery. This for me was personally the most interesting uh, findings of this paper. When they look at clinical outcomes, especially the ODI scale, patients that underwent bifosinate treatment had lower ODI uh, scores when compared to the control group at 12 months. When comparing uh, PTH uh, to a control group in respect to ODI score, the patients tended to have lower scores, uh, but in the teriparatide group, uh, this was not uh, significant. Uh, furthermore, uh, when uh, looking at clinical outcomes uh, in respect to the visual analog uh, scale in respect to pain, patients that had uh, treatment with bifosinate had lower uh, pain scale when, control when compared to a control group at 12 months. And the same trend was seen when using uh, PTH postoperatively, there was a significant decrease in the pain scale after surgery. So not only does you know, treating patients with osteoporosis uh, you know, increase the rate of successful uh, fusion rates, but also patients do clinically better uh, than patients that are not treated uh, with these uh, modalities. So what are the future directions of treating patients with osteoporosis? There's been a development of uh, several monoclonal antibodies. One of them is the nosobap which basically is analogous to the osteoporotering um, protein that we talked about in the osteoclastogenesis uh, diagram, which basically uh, inhibits the interaction between the rank ligand and the rank receptor, which inhibits the differentiation of uh, osteoclasts. On the other hand, we have Romosumab, which inhibits uh, an osteocrite secreting protein called uh, sclerostin, which functions to negatively regulate osteoblasts. So that inhibition of this protein thereby promotes uh, bone formation. So what's, what's some of the evidence behind the new monoclonal antibodies? So the Freedom Trial, which was uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, looked at the use of the nosumab for prevention fraction in uh, postmenopausal women with osteoporosis. They look at close to 4,000 women, which were treated with the nosumab for uh, every six months for 36 months. And uh, the primary endpoint, which was uh, prevention of vertebral uh, bone fractures, 
was reduced uh, around 68%. Also at 36 months, bone mineral density was increased uh, but close to 10%. Uh, the 10 year follow up of the, the Freedom of Trial again showed the same findings um, and the benefits seen on the first trial would reduce vertebral bone uh, fracture, hip fractures. And more interesting, there was a linear increase uh, at the bone mineral density, sorry, in the lumbar spine to close to 22% at 10 years. And the safety profile uh, was very uh, was similar to other medications as PTH and um, um, biphosphonates. There's only one study looking at the use of denosumab for um, treatment in uh, lumbar fusion. And this study from 2018 uh, looked at uh, 26 patients that compare the treatment of PTH alone with the use of uh, teriparatide and denosumab as a combination. And at six months, there was a significant uh, increase in successful spinal fusion rates in the combination group when compared to just using uh, PTH. At 12 months, there was definitely an increase in the uh, fusion rates uh, but there was, this was not um, significant. Sorry. In respect to Ramosumab, uh, there's uh, this uh, you know, landmark paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine where compare Ramosumab to uh, alendronate for prevention of fractures in patients with osteoporosis. Uh, they basically looked at 4,000 patients that received either um, by phosphonates uh, alone or romosumab in combination with uh, by phosphonates. And again, there was a, a significant reduction in the, uh, in the incidence of vertebral uh, fractures. Uh, but more interesting, at 36 months, there was an increase in bone mineral density in the lumbar spine close to 15%. And the uh, uh, patients were treated with the monoclonal antibodies when compared to patients that only have biphosphony. Um, here is uh, a table from one of our review articles uh, that shows uh, where the dosage and the duration of treatment for some of the treatment available for osteoporosis. And this is very interesting. Biphosphonates, for example, are usually taken either one peel a day or once weekly. You can only use uh, biphosphonates for from five to ten years because uh, of the presence of a typical uh, of the incidence of a typical uh, femur fractures. And and as we mentioned before, uh, this is uh, directly correlated to the duration of treatment. For tail or PTH is uh, usually given as a subcutaneous injection, but this is done daily. You can only use Forteo for up to two years because there's increased risk in development of osteosarcoma, as we mentioned before. And for the monoclonal antibodies, which I think is going to be promising in the next couple of years, Prolia, for example, is used every six months as a subcutaneous injection and can be used up to 10 years. On the other hand, Ramosumab is uh, given again as a subcutaneous injection but once a month for a year. So this monoclonal antibodies are going to be very attractive for patients because they're, you know, they can be used every six months, and you don't have to be taking a pill like biphosphonates daily. And there's several studies looking at this, and they suggest that patients that are taking biphosphonates usually only take it for eight to twelve months because you know they're tired of just taking a pill every day. So this, is, this is an attractive alternative for patients that have uh, osteoporosis. Hey, Roberto, uh, you know, just getting back to that uh, slide in that paper, I mean, obviously those medications are phenomenal, but the issue yeah. is cost and insurance approval, right. very yeah. difficult for, you know, to get approval. Uh, I just wanted you to make some comments because I know all of us do things differently, but the, the management 
of these medications in the perioperative period, which was really what your paper was about. Uh, you know, the fusion that we try to get during surgery is a careful balance between osteoclast and osteoblast activity. Mm -hmm. So some people say, you know, you shouldn't be giving those meds in the perioperative period. Others say you should, you know, and certainly Forteo is sometimes used to enhance bone fusion. There are mm -hmm. obviously subtle difficulty, uh, su subtle differences between the different meds, but what would you uh, tell people to do with those meds in the perioperative period? Stop yeah. them, uh, you know, and then restart them three months later or just continue them throughout the post-surgery period? What would you say? That, that's, a, that's a great question. You know, first of all, I, I tried to look at the evidence behind that. And there's no guidelines right now, uh, you know, to try to suggest what should we do with these patients? Do we start, you know, the treatment before surgery? What's the optimal, you know, bone mineral density that we want before surgery? For how long do we treat these patients? So, you know, from, from our meta-analysis, most of the studies out there looking at outcomes respect to, you know, fusion, you know, the most study medications are, as we mentioned, biphosphonates and PTH. And all of the studies that look at outcomes, they were treated post-operatively. And there's only one paper that talks about negatively about the use of biphosphonates in patients that underwent fusion. And this was uh, seen at six months post-surgery when compared to the placebo group. So, but interestingly, at 12 months, the patients that used biphosphonate postoperatively had similar fusion rates at patients that did not. So from all the evidence that it's out there, I think, you know, my, my understanding and my suggestion is that patients should be started as soon as possible, and they should be continuing these treatments um, after surgery for as long as, you know, as it is suggested by the, by the companies. For example, Forteo is two years, the Nesprolia is up to 10 years, because from all the evidence there is, there's Although there's, you know, there's this worrisome that it's going to interact with the osteogenesis and the fusion rate on the formation of fusion mass, there's still no evidence in humans that suggests that using any of these treatment modalities will negatively impact, um, you know, bony fusion mass. So, but again, there's, there's not a lot of evidence, especially with the new monoclonal antibodies. And I think that's a great question. And then hopefully in the next couple of years with more evidence, we can come up with guidelines on you know, when to start a treatment for how long. But for right now, with the limited evidence do we have, there's, there's no evidence that suggests that using any of this treatment you know, negatively impacts the uh, diffusion rates and the outcomes in patients. That's a great question. Um, Roberto, and, can, I, can I add something? Yeah. Um, I think I appreciate you putting together those uh, review meta-analyses. That was really interesting. It's something I was thinking about when I put the grand rounds together. And um, I think one other factor is that it mitigates the um, bone loss associated with inactivity after spine surgery. And maybe as Dr. Wang and, and Greg put together some of their activity data, we can, I don't know, correlate the two, but, but it does potentially mitigate the um, dip in bone mineral density associated with inactivity after surgery. Um, so my thought would be to continue everything um, if possible. That's interesting. Yeah, that's, that, that's a great point. Um, uh, thank, thanks, Shelby. Um, so th this comes to, to my next slide. So future studies, there's, there's a couple of studies now that are going to come out looking at the use of uh, these new monoclonal antibodies in patients undergoing spine surgery. And most interesting is going to be uh, comparing the established treatments with the new medications. And this alludes to, you know, what Dr. Levy was referring to, you know, these new medications, you know, they sound great, you know, this great biomechanic, biochemical, you know, targeting, uh, but they're very expensive. And, and for example, a monthly treatment of biphosphonate, it's around $60. Uh, dollars. 
uh, for month for a monthly uh, prescription. And when we compare it to um, teriparatide, it's it's around fifteen hundred. So you know we we you know we we it's going to be very interesting to see if there's any difference in outcomes when comparing this you know these newer medications uh, to the established treatments. And also, how are they going to affect fusion rates with all these new grafts that are coming now? You know, porous, uh, you know, comparing to titanium cages. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see if they're going to affect, you know, the bone remodeling and the fusion uh, rates in, in these patients. Uh, in conclusion, you know, Hounslow units and CT can be used an as an alternative to desk scan as a surrogate for bone mineral density. The active treatment of osteoporosis leads to significant better instrumentation for most interesting clinical outcomes. And I think at minimum, all spine surgeons or any surgeons that are going to be really, um, you know, dealing with instrumented spinal fusion should have an awareness of bone health and they, could, they should have an active role in treating these patients so we can maximize outcome. And future studies with the new monoclonal antibodies might change the way we treat these patients and hopefully um, in a positive um, way. Any questions? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, I guess I'll share my screen. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I want to talk a little bit about deep, uh, deep brain stimulation today. Um, we we have a lot of people come into the OR with me and Dr. Jagged uh, this year and ask us a lot of questions. People ask me questions outside the OR. So I just wanted to uh, take my grand rounds time to sort of go through some of the history of DBS um, and uh, sort of how it works and um, you know what the kind of future directions uh, hold for, for the technology. Um, so here's the kind of um, layout of my talk. First, I'll just give a little, little background information for, for the junior residents in particular um, about some of the, some of these topics and they'll go through the history of DBS and then you know what it's used for, how effective it is for those various indications and then um, uh, the, the kind of future horizons for DBS as well. Uh, I, don't, I don't have any relevant disclosures either. So what is DBS for? I mean the, the big kind of elephant in the DBS room is Parkinson's disease. That's what it's been you know big in for years. It's still the or the largest indication. Um, it's what we implant most patients for here. Um, but it also has these other indications, which we, we do less frequently, but also um, has benefits in for dystonia, tremor, um, epilepsy. We'll talk about that as well, as that's kind of like an evolving kind of, uh, topic. And then there's these other kind of um, smaller areas like uh, pain and various psychiatric conditions like Tourette's and um, depression that some people use it for where the results are a little more mixed. So this is just a, some background information. I'm sure everybody knows who this is, right? If you ask anybody who names someone who has Parkinson's, this is the first person that comes to mind. It's, it's Michael J. Fox. And um, obviously back when he was Marty McFly, he, he didn't look like this. You can sort of see from his appearance now, he's got masked faces, he's, his ties like all disheveled probably from his dyskinesias. Um, and we've all seen him with his dyskinesias on, on TV and um, he's, he's pretty severe. Um, you know, interestingly enough, he's not actually a candidate for DBS, and we'll, we'll talk about why that is in a little bit. Um, Muhammad Ali is another uh, famous Parkinsonian. Um, again, he looks much different now than he than he once did. Um, his is is due to tra uh, traumatic injury from from all the punches he he, he took uh, as a boxer. Um, but again, the same thing. You can sort of see he's being supported here by uh, somebody, and then he's uh, mask has mask faces and is is probably you know having uh, a lot of dyskinesia's difficulties. Um, Roberto is here next to me. He's probably wondering who this famous doctor is. Um, he later became a senator uh, on the West Wing, and it's, he's just, and he's an actor. It's Alan Alda. He, he recently was diagnosed with Parkinson's as well. Um, all three of these people, of course, don't have DBS. You'd see it on, on at least Alan Alda, but um, they are kind of like the famous uh, Parkinsonians uh, of, of today. 
Um, so I, just to review, Parkinson's disease is caused by a loss of dopaminergic tone in the substantia nigra. Um, it affects about 1% of Americans over 50 years old. A lot of those people are undiagnosed. They just have a mild tremor. They don't realize it until they get older or, or just never get diagnosed. Um, classically, Parkinson's uh, has these three symptoms. Uh, they have a resting tremor, which is very noticeable, very classic. Um, they have cogwheel rigidity and bradykinesia. Um, there's some other symptoms of Parkinson's disease, like freezing of gait, um, difficulty with balance, um, that are, are not present in all cases. Uh, there's also the Parkinson's plus syndromes, which which really aren't kind of the purvey of DBS. It's really for in, in Parkinson's in particular these classic symptoms. Um, various people have kind of laid out the uh, circuitry of the basal ganglia to, to kind of explain all of this. This various diagrams of exactly the same thing. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, we'll try and keep it simple with this more skeletonized version. Um, so right in the middle, you have the substantia nigra, which is kind of the source of things, and you've lost dopaminergic tone. Um, and so that has some downstream effects, and you have these, these two pathways, a direct pathway and indirect pathway. And both of those get affected, but it's not a uh, equivalent effect. So what you have is, is a um, overactivation of the, or a, uh, less control on the indirect pathway. So it then runs wild and the indirect pathway routes itself through the subthalamic nucleus. And with that, when that's unleashed, it goes crazy and stimulates the GPI, um, which has also lost its, its uh, leash, so to speak, from the direct pathway. And so what happens is, is that you get a lot of inhibition of the uh, ventrolateral thalamus, which is sort of your relay point for your, for your motor uh, functions. And then from there, you lose a lot of tone that goes to your cerebral cortex. And so that's why the, you get these uh, symptoms of Parkinson's disease with the slowing, the rigidity, stuff like that. Um, this was, Parkinson's was first described by James Parkinson, Parkinson in um, 1817 in this, this essay he wrote uh, called The Shaking Palsy. He, it's, it's kind of an interesting read. It's actually free on, on Google. Um, I, I found it. Uh, you, it's you know, worth it just looking at briefly. He describes a bunch of cases and stuff like that. Um, it's all kind of fanciful English language at the time. Um, of course, back then he's talking about uh, taking off a pint of blood and how the guy didn't recover after he did this uh, as his treatment. Um, so obviously a different different time, but, but nonetheless very interesting. Um, so looking at the history of the treatments for, for, for uh, Parkinson's disease and, and really kind of that fits in the same evolution of DBS, is really around 1950s where everything changed. So pre-1950, everything was a quote open procedure and everything after 1950 more or less was a closed procedure. Um, so these are the, the kind of procedures they were doing before 1950 and I'll go through them uh, sequentially, but um, people were taking uh, motor cortex, they were sectioning the cortical spinal tract in various places just to basically stop the, the motor output completely. Um, eventually they kind of got more complicated and, and started doing things like getting into the internal capsule and, and working on the cervical spinal cord. Um, but they were, they, they were kind of doing anything they could to, to, to uh, stop these uh, uh, motor disorders. Uh, 1912 is kind of where things first began. Um, LaReach had done a uh, poster rhizotomy for what was described as apoptosis, um, but really at the time could have been easily Parkinson's. Um, uh, the, you know, an improvement of tremor, various other people tried it, but the, the effects were not predictable or, or not able to be reproduced. Um, so then various other, uh, surgeons had tried other things like cordotomy, um, rubospinal tract sectioning. They tried, they tried all kinds of things, but it really just wasn't having the kind of effects that they wanted. Um, in 1939, uh, Busey and Case had uh, noted that, uh, based on a report by actually James Parkinson, basically almost on probably a hundred years prior to this, that a uh, patient of his had had a cerebral infarction of the motor areas um, and the supplementary motor area. And um, that person's tremor had resolved. So they started resecting these areas as well. And obviously, you know, if you take out the motor area, you're gonna stop tremor, but you're gonna cause paralysis. Um, and eventually they gave up on that as well because they had, our, you know, there's no stealth, there's no CT scans. They're having to open up and, and look, figure out where's the motor strip and they're not always guessing correctly. Um, also 1939, uh, Myers uh, started doing a little bit more aggressive approaches, going transventricular and resecting uh, the caudate head. Um, he was successful in his first patient, 
Um, and then he had an, a period of where he wasn't having good results. So he started just basically experimenting and taking out various things. And what he discovered was that the internal capsule and the palatal fugal fiber system, um, uh, those sectioning those areas uh, produced the kind of results he was looking at. Um, he was seeing about 60% uh, um, reduction of tremor. Um, of course, his mortality was quite high, as you might imagine at that time and doing that kind of a surgery. Um, the mortality of this period was like it's shown here, 17 to 41%, pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, 1950s, people were kind of understanding that basal ganglia circuitry is where probably where the source of all these problems are. Um, they're doing, sort of doing transtemporal resections of the uh, globus pallidus and the ANSA. Um, the mortality, at, I'm sorry, mortality at the time was less, I mean, still very high, 7.5%. Um, eventually an accidental anterocortical artery ligation um, led to the kind of classic infarct syndrome, um, which eventually became a, a treatment for uh, Parkinson's disease. But again, this was very unpredictable. You'd get infarcts in places you weren't expecting. People would become hemiplegic. Um, and, and again, the mortality became uh, quite high. So after 1950, like I mentioned, um, you started seeing the more closed procedures and those being pallidotomy and thalamotomy. Um, and like I mentioned before, um, uh, Michael J. Fox never, never actually is a candidate for DBS because he's had a thalamotomy in the past, um, which he had kind of in the, in the nineties, right around when DBS started first hitting the, hitting the market. Um, the first lesioning procedure is actually described earlier in the 1920s, but because they, there was no, um, there's no obviously there's no CT scan, but they didn't have any anatomic atlases. Uh, it was very reliant on anatomic landmarks. You'd have to take this, the bone off and, and figure out um, how you're going to get there. Uh, and so it, it, it didn't really catch on until the 1950s um, when the first stereotactic at, uh, atlas was developed by these two gentlemen, um, Dr. Uh, Weisses and uh, Spiegel. Um, Spiegel was a, um, a refugee from the Nazis, and then Weisses was his originally his student, and then eventually became his colleague. Uh, you can see them down in the bottom right corner, um, uh, working on their their uh, one of their ablations. At the time, they had this, these large Faraday cages to protect the uh, system because they they didn't have a way of isolating the uh, 60 hertz hum from the system from the from the electrical out, uh, outlets. Um, Atlases became more available at this point. Some of them were based on uh, anterior commissure, posterior commissure, or frame of Monroe, because at the time, the way that they were um, uh, figuring out where these structures were was with ventricul uh, um, ventriculograms. Uh, and so the ACPC line, which I think is probably more common these days, it was harder to figure out than using the frame of Monroe and, and, and the posterior commissure. Um, so at this point, they started doing stereotactic ablations of the globus pallidus and the ancillary lenticularis, but there wasn't good effects on the Parkinsonian tremor and rigidity. Um, there was a, a case done by Kukmar Bravo with an accidental thalamotomy, which showed favorable effects. Um, and then the pallidotomy eventually got replaced uh, at this point by the thalamotomy. Um, some people had kind of postulated that the subthalamus was a source of Parkinsonian symptoms, but they just couldn't. Uh, get the kind of results they were looking for with with ablations in that area, and and if you look at the diagram, you can sort of see uh, it's it's very complex circuitry. I'm not sure how with the kind of imaging modalities ahead of the time, how you would be able to target that really accurately and consistently. Um, so around 1969, 1970, uh, stereotactic operations had basically taken over. Um, the mor morbidity had dropped a lot. The mortality was less than one percent compared to what it was prior. Um, and the procedures became pretty uniform and standardized. Uh, they were using thermal ablations, they used ventriculography. Um, of course, you can't do a, bi a bilateral operation. They obviously figured out that that wasn't gonna work out if you caused uh, kind of these unpredictable effects on one side, then you did it again. It was gonna be very devastating. But unfortunately, uh, levodo or fortunately for the patients, I guess, levodopa became uh, widely available at this point. And this was a very revolutionary treatment for Parkinson's disease. Um, uh, but still, um, some people were still trying to do the uh, ablations um, because uh, levodopa is, has its limitations, uh, it wears off, it's unpredictable sometimes. Um, and so some, a very few centers were still doing the ablations and thalamotomy became a little bit popular again, just, just to kind of deal with these 
um, resistant cases. Um, Leitinen uh, in the 80s uh, reevaluated the, the uh, post ventral thalamus um, and noted good results with relief of tremor. Uh, again, this is an ablation, not a, not a stimulation at this point. Um, but the, the wheels were kind of turning again back to the, the globus pallidus as a, as a target. And so it, basically at this point, you know, throughout the 50s, stimulation had been tried uh, in various ways, they tried it on animals, they tried it on uh, rare cases, but it never really gained widespread support. It was unpredictable. Um, and uh, what had happened was, is that during the uh, ablations, people, to confirm the right location, they'd been uh, using stimulation of the, of the ablation uh, uh, cannula and figured out that some people got relief of their tremor symptoms uh, during this testing. So then they postulated that maybe if we just did the stimulation, people would, uh, improve. So Benabit is kind of the author that's really classically associated with this uh, first attempt and they simulated the VIM nucleus, which we'll talk about later for uh, essential tremor, but in, in a Parkinson's patient um, with some good results. Um, and then in the nineties, we had the, the first kind of inklings of the basic science uh, foundations of what we do today, which is a um, study which was published in science uh, where they induced Parkinson's in a series of uh, African green monkeys with this substance MPTP. Um, and then they treated these, mo these monkeys uh, uh, until they basically were uh, uh, completely rigid. They couldn't move. They basically like couldn't do anything. Um, after they did this, uh, they injected uh, this substance, ibotenic acid, into the subthalamic nucleus. And within a minute, these monkeys started moving the opposite side. They were able to feed and groom. And then over the next couple of days, the tremor, the tremors they had, they basically resolved completely. So they'd figured out that the subthalamic nucleus was kind of a, a central fixture of, um, of the uh, uh, circuitry of Parkinson's disease. So then the 90s, Benabit again did the first uh, supplement nuclear uh, DBS placement um, in one patient. And then the following year, um, they were they, a, a GPI stimulator was placed. And these are long-term stimulators, not the you know one-time stimulator in the operating room uh, testing that they had done previously. Um, and this is kind of what began this, this process of DBS. Um, I think Michael J. Fox actually got his thalamotomy just a little, little bit after this. So it was still in this very experimental stage. And, um, I'm not sure how, you know, I'd feel even if myself, if, you know, undergoing experimental uh, surgery. Um, but basically after this point, lesioning procedures kind of went away. And, uh, DBS basically became more popular for these reasons. It, it makes a lot more sense. First of all, it's not destructive. Um, so you're not, you don't get these kind of uh, uh, effects that the, the thalamotomy and the palatotomy did where you get weakness that was permanent. You, um, it's essentially reversible. And we get people in the clinic who ask us, you know, what if I don't like it? Um, and we say, yeah, you can take it out. I mean, we don't obviously want people to do that. And I don't, and I don't think anybody really wants to once they get it, but it is essentially reversible. It also be turned off. That's another thing. Uh, you don't have to do surgery. Um, it has adjustable effects. You can uh, escalate the amount of stimulation you get. You can, there's various parameters you can play with the pulse width, uh, the amplitude, things like that, and, and, um, and dial in the effects that you want. Um, and now we have a uh, steerable current, which we can angle in different directions with these leads. And I'll talk about that later. Um, that really allows you to fine tune your effects. And then DBS also gives you the opportunity to perform these procedures bilaterally. Uh, previously, these procedures were only unilaterally and these people would have to pick, uh, you know, Sophie's choice of, of which side they want with their Parkinson's disease um, symptoms resolved. And, um, and with DBS that, that now no longer is a problem. Um, so at this point, the, the safety also improved quite a bit. I mean, we're, you know, we're not even talking about mortality here. It's just hemorrhage with the transient deficit is one, one percent essentially. Um, there's a small risk of infection, usually at the pulse generator site, um, and then some authors are reporting a, a revision rate of about one percent as well. And I don't think we we don't certainly have that rate these rates here, but um, this is from a, a meta analysis. So you're probably wondering how effective is um, deep brain stimulation. And I don't, and, you know, we we see these people in the clinic all the time, and it's quite quite remarkable how um, effective it really is, and how much relief these people get. They they look like new people basically. Um, this is one of the earlier studies. Um, 156 patients. They were they were matched um, for DBS and medical management. Um, obviously non-blinded using the target of the STN. Um, 
they had a six month follow up and there was improvement in most of the pairs in both the Parkinson's disease questionnaire. It's kind of a just a question and answer uh, survey for Parkinson's patients. And then the UPDRS, it's the uh, um, Universal Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. The part three is the motor component. So it's a, it's a measure of how, how, what, how your motor improvement is both on and off medications for both of these. Um, so, and their hemorrhage, their hemorrhage rate was, was fairly low infection rate, about the same as, as what I already um, described. So, so excellent results in, in this study. And you can see it here represented graphically. You look at the, um, the, the two uh, groups of bars, you have the stimulation group in the dark blue, and then the light blue is the medication group. And you see the change from baseline as a measure, uh, measured by percentage. I mean, the, the mobility is 25% greater, ADLs almost 40% greater, um, remarkable improvements really in, in all these cases, uh, all statistically significant as well. Same, same study, um, the same two groups, neurostimulation and medication. Uh, you look at the amount of time people spend in their day in the what's called the on state or the off state, the on state where they feel good, they've got mobility, they're not stiff, they're not having bad dyskinesias. And you look at this, these various components here, this is mobile with troublesome dyskinesias. So this is like Michael J. Fox, essentially. Um, half, you know, it's cut in half. It's, it's two hours to one hour of the day. And that might not seem like much, but if you're taking out eight hours uh, of sleep time, which is, you know, represented down here, you only have 16 hours left. I mean, that's, that's quite a bit of time. And then you look at the amount of time they spent uh, from mo uh, in this next group, mobile with tr with, uh, without troublesome dyskinesias, which is really their best on time. Um, it's almost, it's double basically. Um, and the worst group, this immobile, uh, completely immobile section is reduced by a third, or sorry, two thirds. So it's, it's quite a remarkable change. And then you look at the medication group and it's no different. Um, here's another study that we were involved with. It's a multi-center trial. Um, uh, it's uh, the, the one advantage of DBS, I think for as far as research goes, is that you allows you to do essentially a sham procedure um, by giving someone the DBS unit and just not turning it on. Um, so a lot of these, a lot of this data is actually pretty, pretty good from a scientific uh, perspective because you can give these people DBS completely blinded um, tell them their stimulation's on, but they're, they're not getting stimulated. Um, this is 23, 23 sites, one of which was here, as I mentioned. Um, a lot of patients, 313. Uh, they randomized people to, to either implant or uh, uh, with, with simulation or, or not. Um, and uh, a three quarter of those were active and, and a quarter were, were in the sham group. Um, targeting STN, they noted that three hours greater of on time, 42% uh, in the uh, UPDRS3, that's the motor component. Um, and that the, the rates of complications here, the two big ones really are hematoma and, and hardware infection. So I've talked about a lot of different targets for, for DBS and lesioning, uh, but what targets really are, are the ones that are most effective. You get the STN, as I mentioned, and these are kind of the globally quoted rates, um, uh, which sound all pretty good. You the GPI, again, you have uh, 30, 50% improvement in UPRDS, but you don't really have the kind of uh, medication reduction that you do uh, with the STM, which is kind of a big feature of, of that target. And then the VIM is um, more a target for tremors. Uh, some people are using it for Parkinsonian tremor and then adding another lead. Uh, we don't do that here, but some people do that, but obviously you're not gonna get the same kind of effects on the other Parkinson symptoms. So then it's really between these two, the STM and the GPI, which are the two big targets. So you know, how do you pick between one or the other? They both seem to have good results. Uh, STN in this case looks maybe a little bit better on this slide. Um, and there's been really two big trials that have kind of um, looked at this, uh, various trials, but these are the two big ones, the VA study and the NSTAP study. Um, and uh, both of them kind of gave equivocal results for between the two. They were essentially the same results. Uh, in both in, in UPDRS, UPDRS uh, except in the NSTAP study that there was an improvement um, uh, uh, with STN over GPI, um, but this was really only in the uh, akinesia segment. There really wasn't a difference in the tremor rigidity uh, reduction uh, in this case. So then, you know, later studies uh, have been coming out uh, comparing these two things. Um, this was reported in JAMA in 2009. Uh, this is the initial study. Uh, they randomized the patients initially to medical management or deeper in simulation, and then some of them got randomized to GPI or STN. Um, 
in the initial study, uh, there was an increase in on time by four and a half hours a day, which is pretty significant. 40% um, improvement with the DBS uh, on uh, UPDRS testing as well. Um, uh, notably, in the medical therapy group also imported, reported improvement, uh, which is a little unusual, but on actual testing, the, the DBS improved better. Um, and the quality of life measures with DBS were, were also substantially different. And not, their people aren't um, stuck taking their meds and looking, constantly worrying about when their medication is going to wear off, which becomes unpredictable with Parkinson's in its advanced stages. Um, but they also noted that there was uh, deficiencies with DBS when they retested people with uh, neuropsych testing. And it's very subtle. It's maybe to the point where none of us would actually pick it up, but, uh, but on a neuropsych test, you would, you would notice these differences uh, where people had a difficulty with working memory, processing speed, um, whereas the medical management group actually showed some increases. So this is a notable issue with DBS that it's minor, but it, it, that's why we have our patients undergo neuropsych testing prior to, to getting uh, implanted. Um, complication rate's a little higher with the infection rate, but otherwise kind of in line with the hemorrhage rate. This is the follow-up for that study where they looked at the two GPI, the GPI group and the STN group and they didn't notice a difference in the uh, UPDRS scores, uh, at, even at three years, no difference uh, between the two targets. Um, but there's an, and no difference in the on time, but the consistent difference, even with this study and the others, was that the STN group saw a reduction in the medication um, compared to the GPI. So there's other Parkinson's targets too um, that have been looked at, the peduncular pontine nucleus, that's the PPN. Um, you can see it here uh, on these diagrams. Um, that's been used uh, for this, this symptom of freezing of gait that, that some Parkinson's patients have, um, that maybe they wouldn't be a candidate for, for um, STN or GPI. Um, the results have been kind of mixed, um, so it's not exactly the most popular uh, approach. And then there's a new target, which I'll I have to give out uh, credit to Dr. Kahigas for. This is the cuneiform nucleus. It's sort of in the same anatomic neighborhood as the uh, PPN. Uh, there's been some... An, uh, animal studies in Europe where um, in an attempt to get to the PPN, they accidentally uh, uh, lesioned this area, uh, which is the cuneiform nucleus, and they saw that um, they had some uh, return of motor response. And, and he, I think Ian actually presented this at his grand rounds maybe a year or two ago, um, so, or somebody did. And um, and we actually just did one of these, the first implantation of this, which Ian worked for like tireless, tirelessly to get uh, FDA clearance and and all kinds of work. So, so definitely Ian's is definitely gonna take the credit for that one, but it's an evolving topic that you'll probably hear about in the next couple of years. Um, one of the other big indications I mentioned before is, is uh, epilepsy. Uh, this is kind of an evolving topic as well. Um, this is a kind of important study. Uh, the SANTI study, it was a multi-center double-blinded uh, randomized controlled trial where they used an anterior thalamic target and planted DBS leads. Um, the reactive neurostimulator or the neuropace has been out for a while. Um, and this is not that, this is just a standard DBS unit that's firing 24 hours a day, purely in the anterior thalamus. Um, and the kind of idea is that it's interrupting that, that neural network that's causing the seizures. That's not, it's not it's target, it's not targeted therapy. It's a more like the, the vagal nerve stimulator where it's just interrupting the, the circuitry. Um, and this study showed 29% uh, uh, reduction in seizures compared to the control group. Um, during the blinded phase, and then uh, about 56% reduction of seizure frequency over over two years. And then almost half the patients had a, re a reduction less than 50%. Now, these don't sound like good numbers, but we're talking about people who are refractory to uh, all medications. They're, they're not candidates for surgery. They've got multiple seizure foci. They're, they're, they're just basically, these are basically palliative procedures. And then even seven, seven and a half percent of patients were seizure-free at six months, um, or, or, or for, for greater than six months, excuse me. Uh, so it's a good result. Um, and you can see here graphically, you look at the, the two groups. Um, here's your median. I mean, you have, look how many patients are, are getting relief of their, their, their seizures. I mean, if some of these people are having multiple seizures a day, multiple seizures a week. So even a 50% reduction is, is quite a bit. Um, and you see it here as well. You know, the reduction uh, uh, of seizures uh, basically stabilizes uh, after a certain point. Um, Kind of in the process of, uh, of looking at this, uh, looking building this Green Rounds presentation, I discovered that they actually published the 10-year follow-up data really last month. Um, and uh, let's see, I don't know if this is in the way, uh, but you can see that the, at 10 years, 
the results are getting even better than they were at three years. So we have 75% median re seizure reduction and then three quarters of these patients had greater than 50% reduction of seizures and 8%, which is basically seven and a half as before, were seizure free for over two years. Um, and there's a whole additional 9% of patients who had, at the time that the uh, study was completed um, were, comp were seizure free for six months. So, so excellent results um, that actually the, uh, apparently the, the uh, neuropace reps are a little concerned about because they're afraid that the neuropace is now gonna kind of go the way of the dinosaur. Um, uh, the VIM is also a target we use um, uh, for essential tremor. It's not really for Parkinson's anymore, although it kind of started out that way. This is a paper by, uh, by our institution, Dr. Jagged, about how to target the uh, VIM. In this paper, they had 33 patients. Um, they targeted the, the VIM and the caudal zone and CERTA, which is also kind of a source of, of, of tremor symptoms as well. And they had 86% uh, control of tremor. Um, which is better than, than the prior report literature. Um, DBS can also be used for dystonia, um, also has good results um, uh, with kind of a equivalent amount of adverse ev uh, events as, as the previous studies. Um, other conditions that DBS is good for or you know, in being investigated for is a better way to describe it. Uh, OCD, there's ventral capsule, ventral striatum. Uh, also, there's these pain targets. I, I didn't go into them because the, the data is a little bit more mixed and the results are not as good, um, but these are kind of evolving areas uh, of study still. Um, so now that we've kind of talked about all the, a lot of the DBS targets, um, there's some other things that we do in surgery that people walk in, they ask, well, why, why are you doing that? Why, why I heard this, or the patients ask us, why can't we, why can't we do our surgery asleep? Why, why do we have to do this or that? And I just wanted to kind of talk about those things because um, there, there's quite a bit of data on those as well. Um, Microelectrode recordings are something that um, some people use, some people don't. Uh, you'll hear it when you come in the room, there's that kind of fuzzy sound that, that's pretty loud. That's the, that's the machine we're using to, to measure uh, with an electrode what the, what the uh, electroactivity of the brain is. Um, our setup is here on the right, it's this Alpha Omega um, setup. This is a Medtronic setup here in the, in the center. Uh, and then this is really what you're, what you're kind of looking at on the screen. And, and what you hear is that the graphical, or sorry, the auditory represent, representation of what's graphed out here. So as you go from one, um, uh, one tissue plane to the next, you, I guess you could say, or one structure to the next, you have differences in the change of signal. So as you come down, you see that in a Parkinsonian patient that the STN is this kind of, un, kind of unpredictable or, or uh, uneven, very active firing site, as you might expect from someone with Parkinson's because as I showed before, the STN is kind of unleashed and is able to just kind of run, run wild. Um, and um, people use this for ablations uh, and things like that before DBS is nothing new, but um, uh, the problems with, with uh, uh, microelectrode recordings that, that people like to point out is that it does take a lot of time. It does take a lot of labor. You need someone to interpret it. Um, we have our neurologist doing that for us. It adds a little bit of expense and then some people debate its, its usefulness. Um, I think, you know, from what, what I've seen and what, um, you know, what I've heard, it, 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 it definitely seems to make a difference if you ask me, um, but we'll talk about that right now. So here's a study uh, performed in 2013 as 22 patients underwent STN, um, deep brain stimulation. Uh, they kind of compared the targets based on the ATLAS, um, which is the yellow dots here, and then the MRI uh, based target, which is that is the blue circle. And then you look at what the intraoperative target is on the pink, and it doesn't look very significant, but both uh, the ATLAS-based target and the MRI-based target are significantly different from the intraoperative target um, based on the MERs. So there is a difference between those two things. And in, uh, in many of these cases, these leads get, get moved based on the MER findings, um, not based on the imaging. And that's, things have changed quite a bit because of the, the availability of the imaging and the quality of the imaging has been gotten a lot better over the years. So um, that's why a lot of people are pushing to kind of uh, get rid of MERs because it does add time. Um, and then also there's authors who reported issues with MERs. Um, this is a study from UCLA, it's back in 2005. Um, they're still doing a lot of ablations then, um, but you've got a good mix of ablations um, uh, and uh, DBS, a total of 248 procedures. Um, uh, MERs is, is where you have a very, the, the electrode is, is very small. It's like smaller than a hair, but it's a needle. Uh, so you can really, if you touched, if you saw it, you'd see that you could easily skewer a vessel or you could 
poke something. It's not it's a sharp thing. Uh, macrostimulation is where you stimulate the uh, the larger cannula so that you you get the effects of the stimulation, but you don't have the the sharp needle part of this. Um, so they basically had patients with macrostimulation only or MERs plus the macrostimulation. What they figured out was that um, the MERs does have a higher rate of hemorrhage, particularly in hypertensive patients. Um, in, in the ORs uh, here, we are very uh, uh, adamant about the blood pressure being well controlled, and we won't proceed until it's totally controlled for these very reasons, because it substantially increases your risk of hemorrhage in these hypertensive patients um, to the point where it's, 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 I mean, that's, that's, what is that, eight times? No, it's about eight times as much. So, um, and then macro stim, the, the hemorrhage rate was only at one and a half percent. Um, and, uh, but, but we're not talking about, we're not talking about symptomatic patients, but, you know, among this group, I think there was only five uh, hemorrhages, but that's still uh, quite a bit. Um, and one of those remained symptomatic for life. Um, the other thing that was noted was in this study was that there was a very high number of passes with the electro, with the uh, cannula and the electrode in the MER group. So one thing that we, what you have is with MERs is you, if you're just going based on imaging, you just slam it in there and, and that's the end of things because you're not checking. So with the MERs, you're able to check and see am I in the right spot. And so you might find out you're not in the right spot and you have to adjust things. So in, uh, a lot of these cases, they were putting in multiple passes, like two passes, three passes. Now, I think the downside of the study is that I can't remember the time we've made two pass. We made very few second passes this entire year uh, of, of the infold fellowship that I'm in. So to do to say that they're doing, you know, uh, what is that? It's like six, sixty something percent uh, of cases have a second pass. That's pretty high. I think we've probably done three or four second passes total this entire year. Um, so it's that's pretty high, uh, but again, at the time, 2005, maybe the imaging wasn't there. Maybe they were using a 1.5 Tesla MRI instead of a three Tesla. Um, who, who knows? Um, then there's a question of, well, do we do it awake or asleep? Why why do we do awake? Why do we do it asleep? Um, here's our neurologist. We do awake DBS. Here they are doing the MERs. Uh, this is they post this on their Instagram. Uh, they cut me and Dr. Jagged out of the picture, of course. Um, uh, so how useful is it? Is it is it is it even useful anymore given the amount of the quality of the imaging like I've been mentioning? Uh, here's a study from 2004. They have 15 Parkinson's patients who uh, uh, underwent uh, bilateral DBS. Um, they compared match to match, match controls they'd done previously, um, and uh, uh, both groups showed improvement in UPDRS3, um, but it was significantly lower in the awake group. Um, Compared, which isn't better uh, than the uh, than the uh, uh, sleep group, um, and then post-operative levodopa uh, doses was reduced in both groups, so there was an effect, um, but the group that was uh, awake did do better. And then the other thing that was very important uh, was the intensity of stimulation is higher in the general anesthesia group. So when these patients are asleep, we give them a test dose of stimulation, um, and we're able to see. With our uh, with the neurologist there examining them, how much are they improving? Are they getting side effects? Which is the big thing, and they didn't really comment on this on this in the, in the paper. But the, the side effects are a big important issue because if you're not able to uh, utilize the full strength of the DBS unit, you run into a wall where you can't stimulate them any further. And so the amount of benefit that they're having, um, you you can't you're not able to 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 maximize that benefit, so to speak. And they, and when you do this surgery asleep, you figure that out in the office not in the surgery where you can fix things. Um, so that's part of the reason why we do things awake uh, the way we do. Here's another study showing the same thing. Um, again, UPDRS only improving in the awake group. Um, and uh, the uh, even at, at one year, things kind of evened out. You can sort of see it graphically here, but the uh, speech subscore on uh, UPDRS uh, three, or sorry, and, uh, I think it's on PDQ, uh, remained lower in the sleep group. Uh, no difference in complications. Again, here's another one, um, same thing. Um, significant improvements in UPRS3, um, but again, a difference between the two. And again, this is another issue that these a lot of these studies uh, have is the number of tracks per patient is three. That means they're, if they're getting bilateral leads, that means they're doing one extra pass uh, as a median. So a lot of these patients are getting a lot of passes and, and, and as a center here, we don't really have that kind of an issue. Um, so 
you kind of have to take a lot of these data with uh, grant salt. So I just want to talk about some of the, the technology and the uh, horizons for, for DVS. Um, this is the initial one of the initial devices. Uh, this isn't the most initial one, this is the most basic one, the kind of classic one that the patients have had for years. Um, it's made by Medtronic. It's got these four contacts. Uh, they just stimulate all the time. Nothing really complicated. It's non-directional. It's non-rechargeable. We have to replace this every three to five years. Um, something, nothing fancy. Now we're moving on to more advanced devices. Um, we have rechargeable generators. You see this lady here. This is from the uh, Boston Scientific website. She wears this little shawl. You wear it for one hour per week. The devices last five to 10 years instead of three to five. And you have this, basically the same results. Um, we also have these directional leads. Now you have this, this one contact here, which is a, a directional contact. Uh, and you see here, this is the, the two, oops, I'm sorry, the two, uh, companies with directional contacts, Abbott and, and Boston Scientific, um, really helps the neurologist fine tune their, uh, uh, their stimulation in the, in the office. Um, more so even, you know, you've, you've done MERs, you've done micro stimulation, you check all these things, but then on top of that, you, you add the layer of uh, directional uh, stimulation, which is, which helps the therapeutic window to steer the current away from the uh, surrounding uh, anatomic neighborhood. This is a recent development that just literally just happened also um, back in March. Uh, this company Abbott makes a DVS lead, which is steerable. They have kind of gone away from these radio frequency controllers, a lot like your TV to, that they use to adjust the DVS. Now they're using essentially an iPhone. Uh, and if you look at it, you'll, you'll say, oh, wow, that's an iPhone. Um, and um, because they're using the cell phone technology instead of just some proprietary thing, they're able to upgrade these systems to the point now where uh, what Abbott's done is they've made it so you can do programming remotely. Um, part of that, obviously, because of COVID-19 has, has become an impetus. Um, and so patients are now able to get implanted. They'll call our neurologist up. They'll say, hey, I'm having this side effect. And the neurologist from wherever he has his office, wherever he can uh, program patients from there and and it goes over the Wi-Fi. Um, but this does raise some kind of questions which have already come up, which is, you know, what do we do about, you know, somebody who's from out of state is where, where is your license? Where are you being the doctor? Are you being the doctor in Florida? Or are, you, are you being the doctor in where this patient is? Um, and then international programming. Um, we've had a couple of patients come from South America and we always give them basically the most basic implant they can because the person down there only can do that programming. But what if we could program those patients? Is that allowed? I mean, we're now we're talking about international boundaries. Um, we just implanted a patient with the same device who lives in Puerto Rico. Is is that going? Is that legal? Is your license good for that? Uh, those are kind of the questions that still need to be answered because it's so such a new technology. And this is really where things are going, which is uh, adaptive closed loop DBS. Um, because right now, the way the DBS units work, they're just basically giving stimulation. 24, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for three to five years or five to 10 years. Um, and it doesn't really address the fluctuation of symptoms because the, you know, like anything in your brain, there's a, there's, uh, there's a circadian, I guess you could say, uh, rhythm of, of, of how much dopaminergic tone you have at one point or another. It's not an all or none phenomenon. So people still have fluctuations. They still have on off time, even with DBS, but it's not as great as they were. But, but what if you could fine tune that based on uh, physiologic parameters, and that's kind of where things are going, uh, but they haven't reached uh, really widespread uh, uh, use yet. There's no true closed loop stimulation. Uh, however, Medtronic has recently came out with this device, <coughs> excuse me, which is a um, similar to their just their general uh, DBS unit, except it does uh, have some recording capabilities. Again, you see the cell phone controller. This is kind of the trend of things. Uh, this time they're using the, the whatever that is, the Galaxy S7 or something. Um, and uh, they're not able to tune the stimulation based on the, uh, uh, the findings, but they are able to record these findings. So we're kind of taking the steps in the direction of, of doing closed loop stimulation. Um, and that's, uh, that's my talk. Um, does anyone have any questions? Hi, Chris, Dennis, Howard Landy. Uh, very nice review. I'd like to make uh, a historical comment. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Jagat, for uh, mentoring me this year, uh, and Dr. Gracioli for mentoring me as well. Can Can you hear me? Be able to hear Dr. Landy. Christian. Christian. Hello. I don't know if 
his volume is muted. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I don't think he can hear. Well, yeah. let me, let me make the comment. To oh, sorry, Dr. Lanning. <laughs> oh, you hear him? Now? Okay. Yeah, sorry. I had you. I had everyone mute, muted because Roberto was here, so I didn't want to get an echo. Sorry. I thought you were just ignoring me. <clears throat> um, very nice review. I just wanted to make one historical comment that really uh, relates to the progression of events to where you are right now. In the in the 80s, uh, what Leitonen did was he resurrected the pallidotomy operation that he had learned from Lexell, um, which hadn't been done in years because of the success of L-DOPA. But by that time, the drug-induced dyskinesias that people develop with L-DOPA over time um, became clearly a significant disability. And it was found that those dyskinesias respond dramatically well when the operation's done well to a GPI lesion. And that's what really resurrected um, the lesion making and the stereotactic surgery in general for Parkinson's disease. And it became a, a very widespread operation, at least in terms of academic centers. And then, uh, so that, that's what really resurrected stereotactic surgery for, for Parkinson's disease. And then it was shortly after that, that Medtronic and other people started taking their cardiac pacers and modifying them so that you could stimulate the brain. And, and it was uh, an easy leap from there to stimulating these areas rather than making lesions. Because as you pointed out, in the process of making a lesion, all of the deep brain lesions that you would make, you would use stimulation and see what effect you'd get. And you could, you could get rid of the motor manifestations with mm -hmm. just stimulating before making your lesion. But there was no permanent implant for that. So it, it was that, that resurrection of of uh, making lesions to get rid of the drug-induced complications um, that then led to the deep brain stimulation instead of making the lesions and led you to where you are right now. Okay. And, and incidentally, with regard to the electrodes, we did all our pallidotomies with just macroelectrode stimulation and got very good results and did not use microelectrodes specifically because of the risks of them. And I can tell you that in a very good center, as we were getting started, I watched them use their microelectrodes. And by the time they got finished with their microelectrode passes to identify where to make the lesion, the microelectrodes had already made the lesion and the patient was already clinically dramatically improved. Sure, yeah. And, and so we, we decided that they were not necessary. So very good review, nice yeah. talk. Thanks, sir. Yeah, excellent talk, um, Christian. Um, I really have nothing else to add. It's a great talk. You covered just about everything and um, phenomenal. Okay, thank you. Hey, Christian, John Ragan, uh, nice hey, talk. Parker, Parker. Thank you. Question for you. Um, tell us about these neurocognitive consequences associated with DBS. Do you see the same thing with ablation? And w what do you think the pathophysiology is behind that? And how are you going to ameliorate those effects long term? Yeah, I think uh, you know I don't I don't know uh, if if the, you saw the effects with with um, uh, with the ablations or not. Uh, I'm not sure that they were doing the the kind of testing they are now. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. Um, I think uh, now I think they're doing some neurocognitive rehab for these people. Um, I I think a lot of these effects are pretty mild, and I think where the the issue is these people who are kind of borderline and and already when they, when they undergo a neuropsych testing prior to DBS, um, that that's where you really run into problems. I think a lot of, a lot of these people are so debilitated they're, most of them are retired already, um, because they just, they are physically unable to work that I don't think it really is a, uh, has a major, uh, clinical consequence, a major, um, I, I guess, uh, a quality of life altering consequence. It might maybe have a clinical consequence you, you're seeing on the testing, but uh, I don't think that uh, a lot of these people are become totally debilitated after uh, DBS purely because of the uh, neurocognitive effects. 
Yeah, I would just add that, you know, I, I think the answer to the question is um, that there is no perfect answer, except that, you know, I think in this day and age, I, to do this surgery, I think effectively, and to minimize the neurocognitive side effects, you really need to have a, like this multidisciplinary approach when selecting patients, you really need to tease out um, what neurocognitive issues you're dealing with at the time of evaluation. You need to have a group of you know, neuropsychologists um, and people in a room to really discuss these cases and tease out those that are really going to suffer neurocognitive effects that will be you know, difficult for them to overcome. I think if you do this appropriately, as Christian said, I think you really minimize the consequences of this slight decline in neurocognition. And I think the motor improvement these patients see if you select them appropriately, far outweighs um, any of the neurocognitive side effects that you see published in the literature. Um, I think you know back in those days when 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 you know people were selecting these patients, I'm not sure it was done as robustly as we're doing it today. And I think you know this multidisciplinary approach really has minimized um, the consequences of these these neurocognitive side effects. That's that's how I would say we're approaching it to try and minimize that that impact. Now, is this a subset of people who are uniquely susceptible to this? Are these the people who are going to go on and get the Parkinson's dementia and you're just identifying them in the process of treating their, their tremor? It's a, it, it's a phenomenal question. And I think people have asked that question. I think it's very hard to tease out, um, you know, what neurocognitive consequences are due to the progression of disease as opposed to DBS and which, you know, I, I think it's a difficult question to answer. I don't know that anybody's made any, uh, significant uh, progress on, on, on the question you're asking. I, I don't know that you can really tease this stuff out to that extent. I keep us posted, fascinating. Yeah. Christian, uh, Alan Levy. So, so we talked a little bit about dementia part of it. I, I know that depression is a big component of Parkinson's and it can even be an early manifestation. Do you have any data on the beneficial effects of DBS on depression in Parkinson's and whether it's due to the, you know, rearranging neural circuitry versus just making the patients happier that they're less sick. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't have any here. Um, I mean, they, they have separate targets for DBA for uh, depression, which have kind of had mixed results or not really great results. Um, I, I think a lot of these patients do are, are they have a lot of anxiety, especially. Um, which is very much, it's part of, it's part of their disease, but it's all, a lot of it has to do with their lifestyle, which is unpredictable. They're, they become locked in. They, we, we hear from patients all the time that they, um, they you know, that their, their medications are, are, they've taken them for so long and uh, at such high doses, they become unpredictable. So they'll go out, they'll want to go out to dinner, but they, they, they can't because they're afraid that they take their meds and they think they're going to get three hours of time, but then they only get one and they're, they're at dinner and then they're, they're frozen. So, so I think a lot of it has to do is, is social. Um, uh, and, and some of that does get improved with, with the DBS and you, and you see these, we see these people in clinic where they're back living the life that they kind of want to live. Um, and, and, uh, that's, I think one of the benefits of it. I don't, I don't necessarily think it, uh, really, interrupts the circuitry that, that causes those psychiatric uh, issues. I think a lot of it is probably social benefit more than anything else. Yeah, I, I would also just add that our neuropsychology group published a, a, a paper which looking at our own subset of patients, um, depression, pre-morbid depression and anxiety actually improved after the DBS, whereas a lot of groups still select patients uh, in, in a way where they might exclude certain patients because of anxiety and depression. Um, you know, the, there is a link between suicidality and, and DBS. And so it's a very, you know, it's a very tricky thing, but I think, you know, at least in our own group, um, we, we saw improvements in depression and, and anxiety postoperatively. Again, don't know whether it has anything to do with the stimulation or just, you know, change in quality of life but certainly not a reason to necessarily exclude patients, you know, um, in, a, in a black and white way. And my last question, and, and you may not know the answer to this, I was just curious when those early forms of ablative therapy were done, do you, do you know if they ever uh, section the corticospinal tract uh, sort of uh, distal to the uh, distal to the internal capsule and what, what the effects of that were? Was it just paralysis or minimal paralysis? Because we, we just don't have a lot of data on humans of, you know, isolating uh, and sectioning the corticospinal tract 
uh, and I was just curious about that. Yeah, yeah. Early on, they I think after they had they had done some of these these cases where they had taken out motor cortex, they had attempted some um, like lateral chordotomies, and they were trying to get to the the cortical spinal tract. And um, uh, I think it, the results were not predictable. The effects were pretty severe. Um, you're essentially getting these these uh, these plegias, but but you're not really addressing the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. That's that, and the, the unpredictability. And, and uh, the morbidity at, at the time uh, led these kind of procedures to be abandoned, but they, they were attempted uh, distally. Yeah, it was actually, this, this is Ian, Ian uh, jumping in. Uh, just to follow up on that, I think it was actually during a, a pedunculotomy yeah, correct. Um, that Irving Cooper discovered that the ligation of the anterior choroidal artery was leading to these STN infarcts. So he injured the anterior choroidal in the process of doing this. So they were doing bronchiolotomies or distal sectioning of the cord, but as Christian mentioned, uh, the morbidity at the time associated with those procedures and the fact that the response was not the same across individuals led them to be abandoned. Um, so it's hard to, hard to know exactly what the long-term effects of that sectioning is. Christian, Mike Ivan here, uh, great right. talk. Thank you. Mine is a little bit more on, on the question on the future. Uh, you know, you touched a little bit briefly on and the ability now for us to control these devices wirelessly. Mm -hmm. There's no question in the future that there's going to be a larger percent of the population getting these devices. And so what, what is the, the role of regulation of, of kind of the encryption of, of some of these devices to prevent, um, you know, uh, people getting in there? And, and do we really think it's appropriate for Dr. Jagged to be able to control the minds of thousands of patients from his veil appointment veil apartment yeah I, 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 and that's a good question um, I think uh, th I think that's one of the reasons why they they've gone to like a the third party uh, controllers essentially this, this, what's the cell phones um, is part of the is the encryption um, the, these units even though that you're going over Wi-Fi and the signals there the device still has to be paired to the to the, um, the the controlling device has to be paired to the stimulation device, so I um, it's it, it's definitely going to be a, an an area that's that's going to be a problem because I mean I don't know how many people are like you know maliciously looking to to change the settings on the Parkinson's DBS units, but um, it, it definitely interference. Um, you know, you send the, the information to the wrong patient, like that kind of stuff. It could it could be potentially be a problem, um, not actually interacting with them as much as you would in, in the normal normal clinic setting. And then, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have any comments about uh, Dr. Jagged's Vale apartment. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of like the idea. I, I wasn't thinking about this, but I, I kind of like the idea of being able to control everybody from, from the comforts of, of home. But, um, you know, I, I just, I, I don't know what the future is like, uh, Mike, but, you know, I, I think these devices are, there's really, there's really not much you can do to injure somebody with one of these devices as they are today. I don't know what the future holds and I don't know how much control these devices are going to, you know, as we move forward, but you know, in the current state, I mean, you know, I don't know what you can do if you were able to break into or, you know, get, you know, past the encryption that would really injure one of these patients. Um, you know, the worst thing you can do is just worsen their symptoms. There are safety, you know, mechanisms on the device built in itself so that you can't overstimulate and cause lesions and things of that nature. So, um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, it depends, I guess, on, you know, how far we go with, with uh, DBS. This is Ian again. I just add, I think that the, for, for the current motor uh, applications and epilepsy, I agree, it's going to be very difficult to envision a scenario where you could cause a negative side effect other than just having the patient have their, their uh, baseline symptoms. I think as you start looking at the closed loop systems, uh, like uh, Christian was talking about the new Medtronic per sub device and when it gets supplied to broader indications such as, uh, you know, uh, depression or other neurocognitive things, psychiatric illness. Um, and then now you have the ability to do closed loop modulation or even uh, other types of stimulation settings. I think they're uh, sort of a Pandora's box in terms of what can happen because the circuits are not well understood and uh, and there are, as you said, um, you know, that, that area is still kind of open. And as this moves on to other indications, you know, everybody's seen the new Neuralink stuff from Elon Musk. 
if everybody's going to be getting these implants and for what indication, I think it's going to be left up to people in the, the neurosurgical community and neurology community to really make sure that they're sort of deployed in a very ethical manner and, and safe so that you, know, you can prevent you know, untoward um, effects that we are not really anticipating when you're kind of aiming to just help patients with their, their specific pathology. So I, I think it's going to be an important question to address as they become more pervasive, but how exactly to, to limit them is going to be, uh, you know, should be sort of driven by the, the medical community much more so than we're ver currently involved in the development of the actual technology. So it's a, sort of a tricky, tricky area that's going to require us to be involved in. I just hope uh, I'm around to uh, have to deal with that dilemma. Talking about advances, uh, there are different areas that, that are made as well. Uh, FDA regulated is only OCD for psychiatric diseases, but uh, I'm in contact with the people in Toronto. We're looking into a uh, multi center trial to start um, DVS for PTSD, for example, which could have an interesting application in the military setting, as we have a lot of vets with PTSD. Also, uh, we know there are advances in motor recovery after stroke. The people from Cleveland uh, have good results even after two years uh, post-stroke. I mean, DVS is a, is a great uh, tool to use because as Chris mentioned, it's um, a modulation strategy. We don't induce injuries or lesions, so it can be explored in different ways. Uh, Chris, uh, maybe just shortly circling back to the depression associated mm -hmm. with um, DBS with and Parkinson's. Uh, uh, we should mention that sometimes we it, it plays a role in choosing the target. So we lean more towards the, the, the palliative uh, stimulations uh, compared to the subthalamic to sure. avoid like the uh, and also, if the patients are already implanted in the subthalamus, uh, we, sh we try to actually to choose the, the contacts that are more lateral into the motor subthalamus and avoiding the, the medial part mm -hmm. to avoid the limbic uh, symptoms. Because sometimes we see hypomania, mania, or, or worsening the depression with a subthalamus stimulation, right? But yes, it was a great talk. Uh, you could summarize every, every aspect of the, the main indications. Yeah, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.